for the ancestors. Alpha Kappa 
Alpha Sorority, Amina Pilgrim, the Brockton Public Library, Mass Cultural Council, and Rita Mendez, our state rep. Good morning, everybody. First of all, I want to thank Harambe and, of course, um, Jackie and Gwen, uh, who continue to just amaze all of us in the city, right? They don't have to do what they do. They do it really for all the youngsters that are here, right? And so I've said this many, many times. It happens to be Black History Month, but I don't like the word month. We have to, uh, specifically uh, here in Brock, we have to set the example. So it should be all year long, and really learning the right history, the right history, Uh, in the Commonwealth and in the nation. So again, Jackie and Gwen, thank you for what you do and uh, enjoy today. Southeastern Regional, shout out to you. Remember, 65% of the kids that go to Southeastern are from the city of Champions. So be well, God bless, and enjoy this day. All right, and now we'll have Stephanie Jones singing our Black National Anthem. Good morning, everyone. So if I could have everyone stand, please. We're gonna give this national anthem the same reverence as we give the one in this country. All right, so this is the Black National Anthem or the Negro National Anthem, and it was created in 1900 for President Lincoln, and it was created by two brothers, um, but one gets the most popularity. His name is James Weldon Johnson, and so I'm just gonna sing the first stanza. If you know it, sing. If you feel like swaying, weighing your hand, or rocking back and forth, this song evokes a lot of emotion. So, are we ready to lift every voice and sing? Okay. <clears throat> lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of a new day begun. Let us march on till victory is won. I say. Good morning, and just in African tradition, if we could say ashe, and that just means let it be. It's similar to amen, like let this be so. So if you hear something today that resonates with you, that helps you, just say ashe. So for our drummer, amazing drummer, let us say ashe. ashe. For the Black National Anthem, let us say ashe. ashe. For all of you that are here, you could have been here anywhere else. We are grateful on a cold day, but warm hearts and warm feelings and the wonderful vibrations that you are about to hear from our storyteller. And I'll let you do a little intro. He'll do a little intro about himself and then get ready um, to be engaged. Thank you. Ashe, my friends. Ashe. My name is Len Cabral. I live in Rhode Island. I travel around the country, I tell stories. And I'm glad to be here and be here with you in the wonderful town and for this wonderful event. So uh, I'm a storyteller and um, I, uh, I tell stories that I used to hear from my grandparents. I tell stories that I've written and uh, I tell many stories that I've read in books from 
libraries in that 398.2 section. That's where the folk tales live. And so uh, I'm going to share some different stories with you this morning. Uh, my grandparents, they came from the Cape Verde Islands. My, my great grandfather on my father said he was a whaler. And the only way to get off those islands, which were right off the west coast of Africa, uh, back in the early 1900s and uh, late 1800s and mid 1800s, was to get a job on a on a ship, because it was a Portuguese colony. A lot of those ships were Portuguese whaling ships, and my great grandfather, his name was Ben Varela, and uh, he uh, he went down to the, he was 16 years old. He went down to the docks. He told those men he was 18, and he got a job on a whaling ship. Now picture this, going out, men from all around, from many different cultures all around the world that were whaling, get in a wooden ship and go out in the oceans of the world and pick a fight with the largest mammal on the planet, a whale. And what did they use? Nothing but a harpoon, which is nothing but a spear with a rope at the end of it. But they sailed all around the world to seek their fortune. And many came to, the whaling ships came to New Bedford, Massachusetts. And many of those whalers realized that they had family back home and they weren't going to make a living being a whaler. They decided to stay. And they worked and they, they, they populated Massachusetts, southeastern Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut. And it's in Massachusetts, my great grandfather, Ben Drella, he became a whaler. He became a, a lumberjack. This is in the uh, late 1800s. He became a lumberjack and he cut trees so they can build the cranberry bogs where many Cape Verdeans worked and, and still work. And I always think about that, how brave these men were to get in the oceans of the world, pick a fight with the largest man on the planet, and then come on land and pick the smallest berries on the planet, the cranberries, working all along. Seat there for. Then he went back at his family. He brought his family here. And many Cape Verdeans would come as seasonal workers. They'd travel from Cape Verde all the way to, to southeastern Massachusetts and parts of Connecticut. And they, in the springtime, they, they'd pick the, uh, in June, they'd pick the strawberries. In August, they'd pick the blueberries. In the fall, they would pick the cranberries. Then they'd go back to Cape Verde and come back the following spring. And many stayed, as my grandparents did. And uh, so I'm going to start off with a story about my mother's family. My, my mother, she grew up in Rhode Island. And uh, she grew up because when her, her grandparents, her parents came over, they, they were farmers. Just as my father's family settled in Rochester, Massachusetts, they were farmers. My mom's family settled in Rhode Island, they were farmers. And my mom grew up there. And uh, I grew up in that same town that my mom did. And there was a pond back then near, near my grandparents' house and land called Benjamin's Pond, right up in North Providence, Rhode Island. Benjamin's Pond, real pond. When my mom was a little girl, she'd, do, she'd go swimming there. But uh, when my brothers and I came along, the adults didn't want us to swim there any longer. We could fish there, or, 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 we could ice skate there, but we, they didn't want us to swim there. We had to go up into the creek. And, and we swam in that sandy bottom of the creek all summer long, tied a rope on a tree. Oh, yeah, they didn't want us to swim in that pond for different reasons, but uh, that's what we did. But we used to ice skate there. This is a story about ice skating. And I like to tell this story in February, too, you know. See, uh, I was the youngest of three boys. My mom, she had four boys. I was, I was the baby of the family until I was 12 years old. Then my mother had my youngest brother. I went from being the baby of the family to becoming the babysitter of the family. <laughs> but that was cool, I had a younger brother at that time. But this is before he was born. One day my mom comes home with three pairs of brand new ice skates, you know. And uh, well, my brothers and I were real happy, we were real happy. That the, uh, I was the happiest because like I said, I was the youngest and smallest of three boys. I knew I was going to grow into my brother's ice skates. I had a lifetime of ice skates ahead of me. But that winter didn't get cold enough to go ice skating until way up into February. And you know not to go out on thin ice, right? Never go out on thin ice. <coughs> Always get somebody heavier than you are to check it out for you. Yeah, I'm serious. Get your mom, send your dad. We sent our uncle. 
So my uncle goes, he checks it out, he comes back home and he goes, all right, boys, you know ice cave? He said, great! We grabbed those ice skates, we laced them together, we slung them over our shoulders, we put two pairs of woolen socks into each ice skate. We started walking, it smelled so good, like a new baseball glove, you know, let it smell, you know. We started walking across the kitchen to go out the kitchen door. My grandmother, she stood in the doorway. Now, we couldn't tell if we lived with her or she lived with us. It was sort of a gray area there. She stood in the doorway and she said, Spera, which meant wait. You see, she didn't speak English, she spoke a Creole. She said, Spera, which meant wait. And then she said, Sinta, which meant, we sat right down, we always did it, my grandmother said, we sat right down. So but we sat down, my grandmother, she walks across the kitchen over to this big cast iron stove. We, uh, it's a, it used to be a wood burner, but they converted it, they made it an oil burner. Uh, and it said, Glenwood, across the oven. She walks over to the oven, she opens up that oven, looks in, closes the oven, looks at us and says, Spera. And she walks into the living room. We're sitting there saying, come on, the ice is going to melt, come on, we're going to wash it, come on. <laughs> but we wouldn't dare leave now when she said, wait. So we waited. And a short while later, she walks back into the kitchen. <coughs> she walks over to the stove. She opens up that Glenwood oven. She reaches in with two mittens on her hands. She pulls out a tray. And she places that tray on top of the stove. And on that tray are six baked potatoes. We watch her as she wraps each one up in thin brown paper. Then she walks over to us, reaches into her ice skates, pulls out the woolen socks, and puts a potato into each ice skate. And then she puts the socks back on top. We just watch. We don't say anything. We just watch. And then she says, go. <laughs> My grandmother, she didn't mince words, you know. We hit the door. Bam. We live about an eighth of a mile from the pond. We're down the end of our street, there's Middle Springs, Douglas Avenue, there's Fatoski's Market. We should go there and get penny candy. Yeah, penny candy. And right across the street from Fatoski's Market was Walker's Market. We should go there and get popsicles for five cents. The kind with two sticks, you could break them in half, share them with a friend. And then there was Morrissey's Gas Station. We could go there and put air in our bicycle tires. Free air, think about it. <laughs> and then it was uh, Salona's gas station. We'd go there and he kept the pin. We could fill up our basketballs and our footballs. Our basketballs would bounce like new money. So we had to cross Middle Spring Avenue. There was Lee's Farm. Had to go underneath the barbed wire fence and then cut across the field, keep an eye out for the bull. Never turn your back on a bull. <laughs> we went across that field, underneath the barbed wire fence, there's a great big bulletin board. Underneath the bulletin board, and there was Benjamin's Pond. The ice was crystal clear. Oh, we couldn't wait. We sat down on a, on a log, we kicked off our shoes, reached into our ice cave, took off the woolen socks, put two pairs of socks at each foot. We grabbed our ice cave, went to put our feet in the ice cave, <clears throat> They wouldn't fit. The potatoes are in there. <laughs> we just picked up those potatoes. Woo! They were hot. Woo! We put them in our shoes. Pit, pit. Woo! We picked up our ice skates, lift up, put our slipped our feet into our ice skates. And you know something? They were wrong. Those ice skates, the, the, well, those potatoes made our ice skates were warm. We were not on that ice, like I said, we were the first ones there. Ice was crystal clear. We skated, oh, did we skate? We skated for an hour, an hour, 15 minutes, an hour and a half, an hour, 45 minutes, two hours, 12 hours, 15 minutes, 12 hours, 12 hours, 45 minutes. We skated a long time. <laughs> Finally, our feet were a little sore, a little tired. We skated back across that ice, sat down on the log, kicked off our ice skates, reached over, grabbed our shoes, went to put our feet in our shoes. They wouldn't fit. The potatoes are in there. <laughs> we picked up those, oh, they were still warm. Woo! We put them in our coat pockets. Hip, hip, boom. We picked up our shoes, slipped our feet into our shoes. And you know something? They were warm. <laughs> those potatoes that kept our shoes warm. There we were, skating all afternoon. Now we're walking home with warm feet. We got warm feet. <laughs> <laughs> we started walking home and you're feeling pretty good, you know? A little hungry, of course. <laughs> we put our hands in our coat pocket. Those potatoes, <laughs> they were still warm. We ate those potatoes. <laughs> Ice skates and potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
They say that long, long, long ago, the earth and the sky were very close. And the animals, they liked it that way. I don't know why they just did. One morning, the moose was drinking water at the lake, and he, he saw the reflection of the sky in the water, and he, he noticed that the sky was pulling away. And the moose said, my gosh, the sky's pulling away. I better stop it. The moose stood on its hind legs, took its antlers, and the moose stuck its antlers right into the sky. And the moose started to pull the sky back to the earth. And the moose got lifted up into the sky. The moose said, I better let go. And the moose withdrew its antlers and the moose came tumbling back to the earth and landed on the ground with a thud. Thud. That woke up the bear. The bear said, my gosh, the sky's pulling away. I better stop it. And the bear stood on his hind legs, took its claws, and the bear stuck its claws right into the sky. And the bear started to pull the sky back to the earth. Woo. Woo. And the bear got lifted up into the sky. The bear said, I better let go. And the bear withdrew its claws, and the bear came tumbling back to the earth and landed on the ground with a thud. That woke up all the animals. <laughs> they said, my gosh, this guy's pulling away. What are we going to do? Come on, let's have a serious meeting. And they all started to walk to the longhouse, have a serious meeting. And on the way to the longhouse, out from the bushes stepped Grandmother Spider. Grandmother Spider said, wait, I have a plan I know we can do. Those animals, they looked at Grandmother Spider and they said, listen, Grandmother, we know you have much wisdom, you know many things, but Grandmother, this is a bit out of your league. You see, the moose could not pull the sky down and neither could the bear, and they're both a lot stronger than you are. Not now, okay? But wait, I have a plan, I know we can, not now, all right? And they stepped over Grandmother Spider and they walked into the longhouse. Well, Grandmother Spider, she didn't get discouraged. Grandmother Spider, she walked up the side of that mountain. When she got to the very top of that mountain, Grandmother Spider started to spin a web. She spun and she wove and she spun and she, can you help me with that? She spun and she wove and she spun and she wove and she spun and she made and she a large ball of thread. She took one under that thread and she tied it to a tree. And then Grandmother Spider threw that ball of thread up into the air. And that ball of thread went up and up and up and it started to unravel and unravel and unravel and it fell short. Well, Grandmother Spider, she didn't get discouraged. She did that web back and she spun and she wove and she spun and she wove and she spun and she wove. And she made a larger ball of thread. And once again, Grandmother Spider threw that ball of thread up into the air. And that ball of thread went up and up and up and it started to unravel and unravel and unravel. And once again, it fell short. Three times, Grandmother Spider threw that web up. Three times, it fell short. But Grandmother Spider, she didn't get discouraged. She didn't give up. Grandmother Spider, she... And she made a great big ball of thread. And keeping her eye on the sky, she threw that ball of thread with all her might. But this time, she did not throw it underhand. This time, Grandmother Spider threw that ball of thread. And that ball of thread went up and up and up, and it started to unravel and unravel and unravel, and it reached the sky. Well, Grandmother Spider, she pulled that web real tight. And then she started to climb that web. And as she climbed, she 
is fun and she's flying and she's flying. When she was way up in the sky, she spun another web. But she attached it to the, to the sky and she swung down on that web. And as she swung down, she spun and she wove and she spun and she wove and she spun and she wove all the way back to the earth. And then she spun another web and she climbed that web and as she climbed, she spun and she wove and she climbed and she spun and she wove back and forth, day and night, spinning and weaving back and forth. And finally the earth and the sky went, hey! And the animals, they felt the earth shake. They came out of the long house and they looked and they saw all these webs coming down from the sky. And they knew that was the work of Grandmother Spider. Well, they searched her out. And when they found her, they said, mm. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, grandmother, we're sorry. We did not listen to your advice earlier, Grandmother Spider. You should always remember, grandmother, that you have much wisdom. You know many things. But grandmother, we're so glad you've done this wonderful thing. And grandmother, because you've done this wonderful thing, you can live in our home forever and ever. <laughs> and ever since that day and time, spiders have lived in animals and people's homes. In my house, they love the shower. <laughs> I don't know why. In the basement? In the garage? Oh, the garage is dead. And I'll tell you something else. On a sunny day, maybe some of you show up this morning. I hope tomorrow's sunny. Early in the morning, when you first get up, if you look outside, just right, sometimes you can see these webs coming down from the sky, passing through the clouds, right to the tops of trees, or to the sides of buildings, or right to the ground. You can see them. Some people will say, don't be silly, that's sunlight. Mm -mm. That's the work of Grandmother Spider. And those are the webs that hold the earth and the sky in place. <laughs> There you go, keeps bouncing off. So uh, I'd like to share a, uh, a story that I wrote and um, from 1976, I, I was living in an apartment in Providence and I was living in an apartment across the street from a building that my brother was working in. And every now and then we'd go out for lunch together. One day we're not for lunch, it was in August. It was a hot August day, I was driving. We had lunch, we were driving back to where I lived and where he worked. And as I was driving up the street, riding down the street on a bicycle that was way, way too small for him, was this guy who was huge. He was huge. He didn't have a shirt on. All he had on was muscles. <laughs> he had muscles on top of muscles. He had muscles where most of us don't even have places. <laughs> he, was, he was so big, he'd make King Kong apologize. <laughs> He's riding down the street. I said to my brother, Allie, look at the size of this guy. And as he rode by us, he blocked out the sun. We were in the shade. I said, wow. <laughs> I continued driving until we came to a parking lot. It was a community parking lot. I pulled into that parking lot and I looked. And right there in the middle of the parking lot was a car and its four doors were open, and there were people sitting in the car. And the people in the car, they just had their lunch. And I could tell they just had their lunch because everything they didn't eat was on the ground outside the car. There were potato chip bags, soda cans, McDonald boxes, Dunkin' Donut boxes, banana peels, all this trash. I said, no way, no way. They're gonna clean this mess up. I live here, they don't live here. They're gonna clean this mess up. So I parked the car. My brother and I, we get out of the car. We start walking across the parking lot 
feeling like a couple of gladiators, you know. When all of a sudden I stop, because I notice from the corner of my eye, I notice that fellow with all the muscles. He rides that bike into the parking lot, gets off the bike, gives it to a little boy whose bike it was. And that fellow with all the muscles walks across the parking lot over to that car and he sits down in the driver's seat. It's his car. Those are his friends. It's their trash. Right away I stopped. I had to reevaluate the situation. <laughs> I said to my brother, I said, hey, Ali, you know, uh, <laughs> it doesn't look that bad. <laughs> it didn't look that bad. I said, I can always clean it up myself, no problem. Well, let's go. And I thought my brother agreed with me as we walked across the street. We stood on the curb on the other side of the street. We stood there and we watched and we listened as all the doors of that car closed at once. Boom! And that fellow with all the muscles, he puts one hand on the steering wheel, drops his other arm out the window of the car. His arm is so long, <laughs> it touches the ground. He kickstarts the car with a little nudge. <laughs> His knuckles are dragging on the ground. <laughs> Sparks coming from his jewelry. <laughs> he pulls out of the parking lot, out into the street. He starts to drive by us. I'm standing there like this. <laughs> when all of a sudden I hear my brother's voice, my brother says, excuse me, excuse me. My heart goes, Ding! excuse me. The fellow driving the car looks at us, reaches back, pinches the rear tire of the car. <laughs> My brother said, excuse me, can we have all that stuff over there, you know, the banana fields, the soda cans, McDonald boxes, Dunkin' Donuts boxes, can we have all that stuff? The guy looks at us, looks at all that trash, looks back at us, reaches over and he grabs the shift. I'm praying that he's going to put it in reverse and not park. He puts it in reverse. He releases the rear tire of the car. The car rolls back down the street. He turns it into that parking lot, right into the center of all that trash. He pinches the rear tire. He gets out of the car. He orders his friends out of the car. He points and they pick. He points and they pick. He points and they're as afraid of him as I am. <laughs> they pick up all their trash, plus trash that had been there for six weeks. <laughs> they put it in a big dumpster. They get back into the car. The doors all close. Boom. <clears throat> he puts one hand on the steering wheel, drops his other arm out the window of the car. His arm is so long, it touches the ground. He kicks out <coughs> the car once again with a little nudge. His knuckles are dragging on the ground, sparks coming from his jewelry. He pulled out of the parking lot, out into the street. He starts to drive by us. I'm standing there like this. <laughs> he looks at us and he goes, <laughs> and he drives down the street. I go, my brother nudges me and says, Len, it's not what you say. It's how you say it. <laughs> I guess that's why my mom always says you get more bees with honey than you do with vinegar. Yeah. And that leads me to talk about proverbs, you know. There's a wonderful African proverb that says we have two ears and one mouth, which means we should listen twice as much as we should speak. Because we learn more when we're listening than we do when we're speaking. And I, I, I always encourage us adults, we adults, to share Proverbs because I, when I say something like, um, uh, 
you get more beef with honey than you do with vinegar. I have high school students and middle school students asking me if I made that up. <laughs> Which tells me that we as adults are not using the Proverbs as our parents and our grandparents did. And Proverbs are pearls of wisdom from every culture on the planet. And the, you know, the, the just little pearls of wisdom that if you don't get them right now, they'll get them older. I mean, the first time I heard the expression, um, one of my mother's friends came in the house and said, Anna, I'm having such a good day, I killed two birds at one stone. I was like, where are they? How'd you do it? Were they lined up? <laughs> it, it, and so uh, I always encourage people to use Proverbs because they are, pro and every culture has them. Every culture has Proverbs, and they're pearls of wisdom, and the youth need to hear those wisdoms shortened instead of getting too long with them. You know about their attention spans, you know. So, uh, so uh, I think I'd like to share uh, one more story. I this, uh, right? I'd like to share this story, um, and it's from East Africa, and it's. I, I like to share the story because we get so many stereotypes in folklore and folk tales and in society in general, but especially in fairy tales that we encourage to read to children. You have to be aware of the, uh, the stereotypes that, that uh, either ageism, uh, sexism, or racism, yeah, and other stereotypes. And so, yes. Very temperamental. Uh, and so, it goes like this. There was a boy who was 10 years old and his mother died. He was very sad that she died. He was confused about her death and he was angry about her death. And after a year, after a year's time, his father remarried. He married a woman whose name testing. Hello? Hello? Okay. Okay? <laughs> you sure? <laughs> so he married this woman. Her name was Sonia. And she was as beautiful as the morning sun. And the boy, uh, uh, it, it, he felt, and so Sonia loved the boy very much. And she made beautiful clothing for the boy. And the boy would wear the clothing and run through the briars and rip them. She'd make wonderful meals for the boy. The boy wouldn't touch the food. Try as she would, she could not win this boy's love. For the boy, for you see, the boy was still sad that his mother died, angry, confused, threatened, and he felt because now, because of Sonia's presence, his father wouldn't love him as much, but he loved that boy, and so did she. And one morning, the father got up and went hunting. Sonia said, today, I'm gonna to talk to my stepson about our feelings toward one another. For I love him dearly, and I need for him to return that love to me. And Sonia walked into the boy's room and he was sitting on his cot. And he had a feeling that she was gonna come in and talk to him about his feelings. He didn't want to talk about his feelings. He was, he was angry, he, was, he didn't want to talk about his feelings. As soon as Sonia walked into that room, that boy jumped off that cot and said, I hate you, you're not my real mother. I hate you, I'll never love you, I'm running away. And he ran off. Sonia was crushed. She sat down and she cried. And finally her husband came home and she said, our son, he ran away. Well, the father went down to the riverbank where many of the boys and girls would go and spend time. And sure enough, the boy was there throwing rocks into the water. He was throwing, he wasn't throwing round rocks. He was throwing round rocks. He wasn't even trying to make him skip, just throwing rocks in the water. The father walked over to the boy, placed his arm on his shoulder, and he sat down on a log. And he talked for a long time about many things. And they walked home arm in arm. When they got home, Sonia had prepared a wonderful meal for them. They sat down and they ate of that meal. And then they all went to their rooms, all except Sonia. Sonia left that house. She walked out of the village, down a dirt road, into the bush. Sonia went to the home of the wise one. Now a wise one is a man or woman of the village that knows the ways of the mind as well as the ways of the heart. So he said, wise one, you must give me a love potion I mean, so I may give it to my stepson so he, he will learn to love me for I love him dearly, but I need for him to return that love to me. The wise one said, first you must bring me a whisker from a ferocious mountain lion. 
Come again? You must bring me a whisper from my throat. How can I do that? Use your wits. Sonia returned home and she did approach. She, 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 she went to her room and she thought about that all night long. She thought, she thought, she thought. And finally in the morning, she woke up. She had a plan for you. See, my friends, the morning is wiser than the evening. And Sonia, she left that house and she took with her a sack. And in that sack, she placed four pieces of meat. And Sonia walked away from the lowlands to the highlands until she came to the mountains and then the, the cliffs. And then she saw a cave. And she said, surely there must be a ferocious mountain lion living in that cave. Sonia returned to that sack, took out that first piece of meat, went over to the cave and placed it in front of the cave. And Sonia went back 100 yards and she hid in the bushes. And sure enough, a ferocious mountain lion came out of that cave, smelled the meat, ate the meat, and went back into the cave. Sonia reached into that sack, took out that second piece of meat, placed it in front of the cave, and went back 50 yards. This time she did not hide in the bushes, she stood in the open. The mountain lion came out of that cave, looked right at Sonia, smelled the meat, ate the meat, and went back into the cave. Sonia reached into that sack, took out that third piece of meat, placed it in front of the cave and took 10 steps back. The mountain lion came out of that cave, looked right at Sonia. She was frightened, she was shaking like a leaf, but she was a brave woman. The mountain lion smelled the meat, ate the meat, and went back into the cave. Sonia reached into that sack, took out that last piece of meat, placed it in front of the cave, took two steps back. The mountain lion came out of that cave, looked right at Sonia, smelled the meat, started to eat the meat. Sonia inched forward, leaned over, reached out. The mountain lion was still eating the meat. Sonia inched away. Until she got around a couple of bushes, then she ran and she ran and she ran all the way back to the wise one's house, knocked at the door and said, wise one, here's a whisker from a ferocious mountain lion. Now I'll give you my love potion so I may give it to my stepson, for I love him dearly and I need for him to return that love to me. The wise one reached over and took that whisker and said, indeed. This is a whisker from a ferocious mountain lion. Yes, it is, but I'll give you my love potion. And the wise one said, I'll not give you a love potion. But, but, and the wise one said, you must approach your stepson the same way you approach the lion. And so he said, you mean slowly and patiently? And the wise one nodded. And Sonia returned home, and she did. She approached her stepson slowly and patiently. In a matter of three weeks, the boy started to smile at her. In five weeks' time, they'd hop right around the house. In seven weeks' time, they'd go for long walks with one another. He showed her how to skip rocks across the water. In ten weeks' time, they became best of friends. That boy never forgot his real mother, but he found room in his heart to love his stepmother also. And that's the story of the lion's whiskers. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you all for being a wonderful audience, and I hope uh, some of these stories that I shared encourage you to share stories with each other. And storytelling is not just for children, as you well know. So share stories, and I want to thank you for inviting me to your community. Did we enjoy the storytelling? We're gonna clap, and what are we gonna say? Ashe, 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 let it be. And um, just to give you an idea, really the theme was really to celebrate the joys and resilience of black motherhood. This was our theme for this Black History Month. And so we had the story, so we're calling it From My Mama's. So the stories from my mama's wisdom, food from my mama's kitchen, uh, the crafts 
in the other room from my mama's hand. So look at the quilting, there are quilting activities going on. And if you notice around the room, so gratefully by my high school friend posted, uh, there are little signs and they are signs for Underground Railroad for quilts. So they are around the room and if you like, so there's one in between that picture there, just look around the room, there's about eight of them and you'll see these symbols and they really are what were made onto quilts during slavery times because they were codes. So a quilt would have on there maybe geese, that would be the clue that our escape is gonna take place in the winter. So these kind of clues were used. So you'll see, if you see any quilt people, if you go to like African American museums and you see old quilts, it's not unusual for you to see these codes on them because they were used as a way to facilitate moving along the Underground Railroad. So each of you just take a moment, help you get up, walk around, and you'll be able to do that. Also, you should have received when you came in. If you didn't, we'll make sure that there's some at the back. Each of you should have a tag, and it is a lavalier that is of a historically black college or university. And the idea is that you will connect with at least three people that have the same one as you. Because there are. There are three other people in here that have the same one that you have on. Connect with them. Find out what do you both know about this um, university. If not, come find either me, Gwen, or Natalie, and we'll tell you a little bit about them. And there other people in the room, anybody else? HBCU? Okay, a little wisdom, but there we go. Where did you attend, please? Spelman. Spelman. Amen. Yes. So anyone, just come around and you'll be able to just get some information. But the idea is for us to move around and get to know each other. And this is one way, a nice way to approach. Oh, I see you have, I'm partial to Tuskegee. My um, oldest daughter, that is where she graduated from. She was the speaker at her Brockton High um, graduation. And I just say, from that point on, life just continued um, in such a way. That's why I have four wonderful grandchildren in Atlanta. Tuskegee, Tuskegee University. That's my HBCU story. I'm a grandmother because of Tuskegee. Uh, so please, um, again, move around. We know that now might be just, we're gonna have some a performance from you, but I just wanted people, maybe since you've been sitting a little while, get up, stretch around a little bit, and just know that the food is here. And I think, Miss CJ, what would you like the Okay, all right, perfect. So why don't we let people get some things and then uh, we'll be able to, I'm sorry, go ahead and give me a signal. Yes, and also inside the children's room, there are quilts, my mom and her group, they're just fantastic quilters. They used to belong to a group called Sisters and Stitches, which are a group of black women quilters um, all throughout Massachusetts. And there are quilts in there to tell stories. And also there's a chance for children or any adults would like to, you can make a little symbol of your own quilt. They have squares and there's cloth and there's glue guns. So you can leave here with the quilt. And also there's a little black history book that's in there as well. It has black inventors, some whom you may never have heard, you may never have heard of. They're, those books are free for children to take, but anyone's an educator, you can take one as well, share with your students, they're in there. And also on the table we have a little black history trivia uh, for children, if you'd like to match some names, that's there on the table as well. We'd like this to be fun, engaging, but also educational. So at this time, I think we'll see if people on this side would like to get your food, um, line up, and the uh, steppers, you guys are gonna go immediately after people have been up for a minute for a break. So even if some people are still in line, I want them to be directed to watch you. Okay. Hello, my name is Annette Rao Thomas, and on display is my wonderful Underground Railroad quilt. I made this quilt back in 2012, and it still looks great. Um, as you can see that it is a representation of the quilt blocks, quilts that were used in the Underground Railroad for uh, runaway slaves. Um, they told the story, they actually told the slaves what to do when they got to a, a certain uh, stop. When they got to, um, oh, when they first ran away, they were told to follow the star. This is a North Star here. And also at the bottom of the quilt, there's another block for the um, North Star. And here is the log cabin. Now that's a 
good story about the log cabin. This little square here tells the runaway whether to come inside the cabin or not. If this was red, then it represents blood would be shed. So the slave knew not to come inside, to stay put, stay hidden away. But if it's dark, they knew it was a safe haven to come inside and have a bite to eat, get new clothing, uh, whatever they needed to continue their journey. So um, I won't tell the whole story, but at the bottom of the quilt, I don't know if you can see that either, um, it has a block that tells the story of each of these blocks that are in this quilt. So that's uh, just a brief history of the Underground Railroad quilt. Thank you so much. All right, all right. <laughs> that concludes today's performances. Can we just get one more round of applause for everybody today? <laughs> All right, so thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, <laughs> on behalf of Fuller Craft and on behalf of Rame Cultural Learning Center, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you. Thank you to Lady C&J for the food, of course. Hope you all got your plates. All right, and we have some craft activities still happening over in the room across the way. If you want to make your own and learn more about quilting, you can head out over there. And again, for those of you that have children, we have the free uh, books for children about black inventors. So there's some left. Please go in the quilting room. And if you haven't been in there yet, please make sure that you go in and see really black history in action by crafts and what quilting means and has meant to us historically. And we'd like to thank everyone that participated. Also, please give a hand to our caterer, Miss Lady CJ. <laughs> we'll say uh, for my mama's kitchen, right? That's our soul food is for a reason. It gives us comfort. So thank you. And on behalf of the Harambe and the Fuller, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, please for future Harambe events, please go on our Facebook page. And, and also if you'd like to um, leave your name, an email, you can do that on the page as well. Thank you.